It is the quality of our relationships that determines the quality of our lives. The story is never just created by one person. It's a co-creation. The way I speak is influenced by the way you listen. The way I see myself is influenced by the way you see me. Why is it when relationships are fundamental to how we feel about ourselves, whether we feel fulfilled, whether we feel happy, why is it that so many of us struggle with what really is a core part of being a human being? I think that, you know, we are wired for connection. We are social creatures. We don't survive well alone. And at the same time, our dependence on others, our interaction with others can cause us situations of utter bliss and situations of utter grief. I tend to think that it is the quality of our relationships that determines the quality of our lives. In the end, it is the people and the way they will remember you and the way you will live inside of them that will give the ultimate um, description of the life you've led and meaning of what you have met, what you have represented for others. You know, we like to know that we matter that I mean something for, for you, and that you mean something for me. We're creatures of meaning. And this meaning making is a set of stories that we tell ourselves about our relationships. Do you like me? Do you not like me? Do you find me attractive? Do you value me? Do you respect me? Do you think I'm smart? Do you think I'm a good person? You know, will you leave me? All of these fundamental questions are continuously relational questions. That's why it's so core. Relationships are continuously a story, what my, my, my friend Terry Real calls of harmony, disharmony, and repair. Connection, disconnection, reconnection. That's the rhythm of a relationship. You know, it's not what it was bad, now it's really good. It was bad, it's really good for this, and then something else will happen. And it doesn't even have to be put in the term of bad and good. Things emerge, new, new issues appear in life because we change, and that doesn't mean the relationship is bad. You know, and there is no perfect relationship. But to know all of that, people need truth. And the truth is not easy to come by because everybody today has a tremendous pressure to prove that their relationship is perfect, that they're doing great. And this kind of fake happiness kind of thing. And in fact, people get a lot more when they know you have had loss, you have, you, you, you've had illness, you've had unemployment, you've had economic hardship, you've been finding it really tough to spend three months with your partner 24 seven, me too. Yeah. And how are you doing? Tell me what's been challenging for you. Tell me what you have found useful. Share the resources of your relationship intelligence with me. Yeah. And I'll do the same. And that makes the world a little bit of a better place. You're a relationship counselor, a relationship therapist. But in many ways, what you're offering people is so much more than relationships. Because if your relationship improves, you get to know more about yourself. So in, in some ways, I think it's all about relationships, what you do. And in some ways, it's not. It's about helping us understand ourselves better. Because when we understand ourselves better, we're going to show up in a much more meaningful uh, and different way in our relationship with much less of our own baggage. It is about relationships, but in many ways, it's just about being a human being. The, the reason you think this way, I, th I would say, is because we have a way of thinking that there is the relationship and then there is me. There is the self and then there is the relationship. But the, the, when you think in a relational perspective, like I am a relational thinker and I am a narrative thinker, as in stories, then I don't see these two as separate. The self is relational. There is no way of thinking about yourself outside of that framework. This notion sometimes that people have that you have to know yourself first, you have to love yourself first, you know, and then you can go and be in a relationship never made sense to me because you only know yourself through your interactions with others, even if it's the ones in your head but they always are relational. So I don't divide those two things. And yes, when I think relationally, I think existentially. 
it's true in the end it is about being a human being what's your place in this in this earth you know what do you represent what do you want to do what do you want to leave behind who are you not just what do you do and how do you perform but who are you and that who are you is always a combination of how you see yourself and how others see you how much you are aware of yourself and how you impact others and how much you realize what others are doing to you. You know, the story of a relationship, it's not just the story you tell yourself because the story you tell yourself is influenced by the character that you have become in other people's stories. Yeah. You know, one of the ways I've, one day I threw out that line and it became a real kind of guide, guide for me. I said to somebody in a session, I said, you know, you have been recruited for a play in this relationship that you never auditioned for. And here you are suddenly representing for your partner all those characteristics which you don't even recognize yourself. But this is what happens in a relationship. You enter somebody else's story, somebody else's theater, and you become a character in their plot. And let alone did you not even know that you even apply to be that character. So the story is never just created by one person. It's a co-creation. The way I speak is influenced by the way you listen. The way I see myself is influenced by the way you see me. People tend to think a human being is a person and they have a fantastic sentence for it, which is that's just the way you are. That's who he is. That's who she is. She's that kind of a person. And I always say with you, she's that kind of a person, but we are not the same person with others. We are not just one person. We may have core characteristics, but we are shaped by the relationship in which we are. We make the relationship and the relationship makes us. And the relationship is the dynamic between you and me. It's the space in between. It's not who I am and who you are. It's what we do to each other that draws from you certain things and that draws from me certain things. And that's the definition of a relationship. It's the space in between. It's a very different way of thinking about it than the two people coming together. No, it's what is it that they create together and what is it that they bring out in each other? You know, these days we, we ask ourselves questions all the time. You know, am I happy? Am I fulfilled? You know, do I love my job? You know, th there's always that feeling that there could be something better out there. And that I think is inherently problematic when it comes to a long-term relationship. So the history of marriage or intimate adult relationships in a nutshell is this. Um, there is a massive difference. There is a massive difference because the expectations of our adult intimacies are unprecedented. We used to marry for survival, for the basic needs of the Maslow ladder, for refuge, for economic support, for family, children, companionship. Then we brought love to marriage. And then we wanted in marriage also to experience a feeling of belonging and a feeling of connection and intimacy. And then we made marriage or adult relationships an identity economy. I want to become the best version of myself. That's a completely different set of expectations. And the way Eli Finkel writes in his book is that the good relationships of today are probably much better than the good relationships of the past. But there are very few of those people who manage to climb Mount Olympus and have an amazing view. The view is fantastic, but the air is also thinner and not everybody gets up there. Now, what also changed is that relationships used to be part of our communal living. And when you lived in a community, you had a few basic needs that were supposed to be met by your partner, but the rest of your needs were met by your siblings, of which you had many, and by your community, and by your religious institutions, and by, and by your, your extended family. All of that today, our need for belonging, our need for connection, our need for specialness, our need for intimacy, sexuality, you name it, has been put onto one person. And today we ask one person in the West to give us what once an entire village used to provide. And that is a tall order for a party of two. This is the rise of expectations that has taken place. And you know, sex used to be for production. You needed many children. 
Now we have about two or three at best in the West, and that means that sexuality is for connection, for pleasure, for intimacy. That is a completely rewrite. We used to marry in our late teens. Today we marry in our late 20s, early 30s. That is a completely different story when you already arrive quite ready-made. And what you want is for somebody to recognize how hard you've worked at making yourself and vice versa. We used to never have divorce. It was married till you die. Now it's married till love dies. These are major transformations to the way we live our adult relationships. And in addition, we live in a world in which happiness used to belong to the heavens. And then we brought happiness down to earth. And first it was a possibility. And now it's a mandate. You must be happy. What's wrong with you that you're not happy? What are you doing wrong? Because if you did it right, you would be happy. And that is all the pressure that people feel that is around them when they look at their relationship and when they look at the happy people on Instagram. You know, part of what I do is say to people, there is not a one size fits all. Let me show you what marriages look like or adult relationships from all backgrounds, from all orientations, so that you stop feeling that there is this one model and if you didn't succeed at that, well, you failed. That you can actually reinvent your relationship, that the story is not over. Start writing differently. Your partner says A, and you've been answering B for the last nine years. Well, try say something different and see what happens. Now the story begins to change. And let me show you how you could actually change the story. Because when you change the story, you change the experience. Thank you for everything you've done over your entire career, the, the way you're bringing awareness to such fundamentally important issues for us to thrive as human beings. Are there two or three top tips that you would leave my listeners with? If you want to change the other, change yourself. You can wait for other people to change for a long time, but you can at any moment decide that you're going to do something different. And when you change the, the, the story, their story changes as well. It really is a dynamic interplay. That's one. Number two, it's really important that you be able to sometimes simply say, can I listen? I think I just need the best way to talk at this moment is to listen. And you don't have to agree with anything. You just want to give the other person's point of view space and validity. There is never just one experience in a relationship. There are multiple points of view coexisting at the same time. It's the beauty of relationship and it's the challenge of a relationship. So that's the second one. The third one, don't ever leave play, pleasure, joy, fun for the end. They are incredibly important experiences of life in the midst of crisis. I think it's one of the most important lessons I learned from my own parents who spent years in the war and then years as refugees and who basically explained to me, we didn't stop loving, we didn't stop laughing because it was fundamental to our humanity in the midst of degradation. It's not true that you need to only stay serious and be efficient machines in order to get through things. You want to stay connected to nature, to beauty, to joy, to laughter, and especially to sensuality. Really hope you enjoyed that conversation. Please do think about one thing that you can take and apply into your life. Inspiration is not enough, you need to take action. If you did enjoy that, please do press subscribe, hit that notification bell, and why not check out this conversation that I picked out that acts as the perfect follow-up.